coined as a phrase to describe the ever accelerating convergence of different technological um, progresses. Is that a, can, can you actually make a plural of progress? Um, toward one point where everything kind of feeds into each other and we end up uh, with a qualitative jump in, uh, in our evolution. A qualitative jump because it's basically going to be a new evolutionary pro uh, process that's going to arise once we will be able to actually upload our consciousnesses to, um, to artificial bodies and live forever. Um, and uh, nanotechnology is one of the fields that, uh, that feeds into this, um, into this direction, being able to actually create matter um, uh, through certain technologies. Um, uh, artificial intelligence is one of the areas that feeds into this development, and so on and so forth. Um, 3D printing of, uh, of actually human tissue, and so on and so forth. Um, and a qualitative jump in that um, we're going to switch from biological evolution and the laws of biological evolution to, to uh, a point where uh, we're going to be um, basically uh, machines and, uh, and immortal. Okay, so this is, the, this is the, um, the thing that's being described as a real possibility by some scholars, quite a few scholars and scientists, as being a real possibility within the next few decades. And um, so, uh, the movie that I had in mind uh, is called uh, Transcendence. How many of you have seen Transcendence? It's really interesting. Not that many people have seen it, even though it was one of the big sci-fi movies that came out of 2014. And I picked this movie because I think it is, as far as I know, the, the, the greatest endeavor to actually draw on all these different things, all these different technologies, um, uh, to, um, to demonstrate what would actually happen if we were able to upload our consciousnesses to a machine. So this, it's the story of a scientist who has made great strides in artificial intelligence, and, um, but is actually um, mortally wounded by um, a group of um, terrorists um, who are actually opposing this development, who are afraid of it, and, and want to stop that, that, that development. And um, uh, he's been shot with a bullet that's laced with radioactivity and um, he's gradually dying and his wife is trying to save him by f finalizing the, the experiments and actually uploading his consciousness to a computer. Um, it actually succeeds. Okay, it's science fiction, right? We don't exactly know how it could possibly succeed the way that they do it. But in any event, so it succeeds and then uh, various questions arise. Uh, first off, um, now it's an intelligence that wants to grow and it grows much faster than anybody has anticipated. It immediately basically um, uh, embodies the whole internet, does everything the internet can, controls the whole digital world. Um, with that also the stock market and everything. And then builds the facility with the help of the wife where they through nanotechnology actually are able to basically overcome life and death, um, make people immortal through nanotechnological uh, medicine and so on and so forth. Um, he then starts taking over the bodies of those people that he has saved and creates collective consciousness. This is where it gets really scary. So he turns into more and more of a mad scientist. We know the mad scientist story, right? Like the, the scientist that is trying to play God and in trying to become more than human becomes less than human. Um, so there's this danger. So the old friends gang together with the help of the government and basically in the end kill him and his wife. Spoiler, it's inevitable. Um, by the way, of a virus that also destroys all technology in the United States and all over the world, so that everybody has to go back to a pre-technological age. The very end of the film, um, we all of a sudden um, there's a there's a moment where the dying scientist, who's in the meantime inhabiting an artificial body that he's made for himself, and his wife are both dying in the you know with each other with a connected consciousness, and she gets to see what he sees, and she finally realizes that all the possibilities that, she, um, that he had opened up actually were real, that he could have saved the planet, he could have saved the natural resources with nanotechnology, that he meant well. Because one of the great questions that arises, is he still him? This is one of the biggest questions. Is he still the good person that he used to be? Or is this person that's been uploaded another one and is he now a mad scientist, is he now evil? Right? So that's actually answered. It turns out that he's still good and actually the whole project was good. So this whole thing about the mad scientist um, fear that is built up throughout the film kind of collapses. And we're left with this open question. So what's the film trying to tell us? Because he also seemed to be really go going wrong when he made all these other people part of his collective consciousness because that looks totalitarian, right? But then in the end, you know, the world is kind of devastated and 
we lost the opportunity for a better world. And so it has this incredible ambiguity, which I think is interesting. I was going to show you a clip, but you know, I think maybe I'll do it if you have time later, but I think I gave you sort of like the drift of the film and that the great anxiety that of course surrounds this whole topic of the singularity um, is in the end, um, and, and all the questions that are being raised are ultimately kind of left open in the movie. And, um, and I think that's an interesting point to start from. And this is where you come in. I think I'll stand because I'm gonna have to refer to this. My memory's not what it used to be. It was never great anyway, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over there. How do I do that? Because they, they want to, to hear you. Oh, you want to hear, do I have to stay, you better to stay here? Oh, no, you can, you can walk, but. No, no, oh, you want me to do? No, okay. Okay, how do I do it? It's easy, we need to turn it. Okay. Seems a little odd I'm talking about technology. I can't believe it. It's a good start. Can you hear me okay? No, it's not working. It's not working. How about now? Better? Okay. Thank you. All right, so I just want to talk about a particular part of technology. I am going to focus on one so it connects to the show as a reference to transcendence. So I'm going to forego uh, genetic engineering and things like that. We, you've already heard a lot about that and you already know. Better? Okay, there. Better? Okay, okay. So, uh, so you already know some of the questions that are presented for you in, in trying to uh, find a clear distinction between therapy and enhancement and things like that. I'm more interested, since uh, we need to make a connection here, to AI. So we're, 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 you probably know this, we're not already anywhere near consciousness upload, but we're doing some pretty strange things, uh, kind of interesting things. There's, a, there's a, a little computer in California called Baxter. It's a mind-controlled robot. And uh, he's in fa Baxter's in fact a robot. He's an industrial robot uh, made for lifting heavy, large objects. And his face, uh, the face is a, uh, you know what I'm saying, his and her is <laughs> one of the problems here, is, uh, is uh, not flesh, of course, it's just a screen. Uh, but the interesting thing about this is there's, a, there's a, uh, a woman who sits across the table that has electrodes attached to her head. And uh, the setup detects a signal directly from her brain and sends that uh, as a uh, command to Baxter. So if Baxter uh, is asked to, say, lift up the cup and, and put it in this can, if Baxter does it wrong, the woman only has to think that Baxter did it wrong, and then Baxter will learn how to do it right without her saying a word. So uh, the commands now are getting a little bit more complicated. Uh, they can communicate in sentences instead of simple words. But nowhere is anything said. It's just thinking it. The, the uh, robot uh, picks up the information and learns from the command. That's kind of simple, but it says a lot of complex technology in there, particularly uh, AI. And we're getting better at that, but probably my generation won't see transcendence. I wish it did, but it probably won't. Uh, probably the, the generation for most of you will see that. What I want to focus on, how many of you have seen the movie AI? Okay, so uh, it was a pretty good movie, a, a typically good Spielberg movie, um, although I think it was in conjunction with the Stanley Kubrick. But the movie is about David. David's a, uh, a, a robotic boy created, uh, actually have a relationship with a mother, and if the mother puts a code into the robot boy, the boy uh, has the ability to bond with the mother. So she puts the code in, and uh, the boy immediately starts to bond, and, and for whatever this might mean to us, uh, feels as though he needs to bond and wants to see uh, Monica, the mother, as his real mother. And it goes pretty good. She's a little bit put off at first, a little nervous about having this, what looks like a, a flesh and blood boy, uh, although she knows it's a robot. He's a little bit kinky at first, but it, it gets pretty smooth. Their original child is in a deep coma, not expected to recover, and that's why they adopted David. Uh, 
uh, as you might expect, the first child comes out of the coma. It comes home, and now the parents have a problem. They've got David, who's bonding irreparably now. They can't, they can't change that back. But they still love deeply, primarily, their first child. They try to make it work. David starts to show distinctly unrobotic behavior. <laughs> he starts to get mad at uh, the, the, the genuine son, now his brother. He gets uh, competitive for the love of Monica. He thinks now the brother is taking mom away. And eventually he gets close to almost killing his brother, although by accident. But Monica's had enough, the husband's had enough, and they have to get rid of, they decide to get rid of David. The way she does that is she drives out to a blowing road uh, for us and drops him off and tries to explain to him she really still loves him, but she just can't have him there. And all he wants to do is be real. He catches on quickly that she knows he's a robot, but he tells her if only she'll love him, he'll be real for her. As though like any child, if only he wished it hard enough, he could be real. It doesn't happen, so she leaves. David is now alone and isolated and sad and scared. Distinctly human traits. So you kind of wonder, how does David start to show this? Well, David's a learning machine. And although it's not discussed in the movie, of course, uh, the idea is that David's learning emotions, whether David, whether learning emotions is the same as feeling emotions, uh, it probably is not. But we don't get that in the movie. We just see David acting as though he feels these emotions. Like any human, he seeks support, so he finds others like him. They're called mechas, and so he finds lots of mechas, and he tries to make friends and get support like any of us would. In the end, it doesn't work, and eventually, David, he goes through a, a tough life, and many of you remember the movie, but at some point, and I'll skip all the details of that, he's, he essentially goes into a deep coma. He's put asleep. He wakes up about 2,000 years or so later, and he wakes, he's been, he, is, he wakes up because the most advanced robots left on the planet, all humans are now dead, left on the planet to find him. And they, they awaken him. And he's as though time has not passed. Because for the way his brain works, time doesn't it isn't experience the way you and I have it. So they awaken him, and David, uh, they realize that he's lonely and hurt. They don't know what to do. They expected David to show them what humans were, because David's the closest thing they've ever seen of a human. For a while, they even thought he might have been human. They realize he's not, but they are committed to making him happy. Whatever was involved in their creation, they have that commitment. And they realize that the only way to make David happy is to bring his mother back. So they clone his mother, and the clone is viable for a day. And they introduce David to Monica. <coughs> and for a day, David has a mother who loves him completely and unreservedly. And of course, he loves her. It's the happiest day in his short or long, it's hard to tell, <laughs> life. All it is is happy. He's, he's found the first happiness that he could ever have experienced, full happiness. Of course, when the day is up, it's over, and David, again, is put in another state of some, of some kind, not fully explained. But he is still viable. He's now searching. He knows he can't have Monica, but he thinks he can become real. He remembers the story of Pinocchio. So he's looking.